It was once the deadliest lake on earth. At the moment the Soviet Union collapsed in a cloud of broken communist dreams, Lake Karachay was likely the most contaminated site in the former USSR. A storage place for radioactive waste material generated by the Mark nuclear facility in the closed city of Chelyabinsk 40, Karachay had spent decades accumulating a level of toxicity unparalleled in history. One single hour spent on its shoreline would have exposed you to a dose of radiation high enough to kill you. Yet while Karajay was uniquely dangerous, its contamination sadly wasn't a one-off. Across the Mark facility, a series of accidents, screw-ups, and poor decisions resulted in an environmental catastrophe. Throughout its Soviet days, it's estimated that Mark exposed those living nearby to more than five times the level of radiation expelled by Chernobyl. Unsurprisingly, many are still living with the consequences. The story of both the world's most dangerous lake and the secret closed city that birthed it, this is the tale of Karachay, the USSR's other great nuclear disaster. Not far from the foothills of Russia's Ural Mountains, over 1,800 kilometers from Moscow, lies a lake with a deadly secret. Or maybe that should be Lay. Were you to travel to Lake Karachay today, you'd see little to demonstrate it ever existed. Just the remnants of a backfilling project that was finally completed in 2015. But not so very long ago, this now desolate stretch of land was home to a body of water almost shocking in its lethality. In 1991, as we already mentioned, standing on the shore of this lake for an hour would do you with enough radiation to kill you. It was just one of a litany of disasters produced by the Mark facility in the mad dash for the Soviet Union to get the bomb. The tale of this mad dash began not in the thick forest surrounding Karachay, but nearly 6,000 kilometers away, above the island of Honshu. On August 6, 1945, the world watched in awe as a new American superweapon exploded over the city of Hiroshima, vaporizing tens of thousands. Among those in awe was 66-year-old Joseph Stalin. Although they were technically still fighting on the same side, Stalin was not super thrilled with the Americans getting the bomb. No sooner had the radioactive dust settled over Hiroshima than he was demanding a Soviet version to neutralize the new nuclear threat. That same year, the USSR began secretly building City 40. Known today as Azersk, City 40 didn't originally have a name. It was a closed city, one never intended to appear on any maps or records. Instead, officials referred to it by the codename Chelyabinsk 40, after the nearby city of Chelyabinsk, some 90 kilometers distant. It was here, in the city's Mark facility, that the Soviet A-bomb would be born. Unsurprisingly, this work was carried out in absolute secrecy. The specialists brought in by the project's head, Stalin's notorious sadist in chief, Leventry Beria, were told to come without telling anyone, not even close family. That's when they were told anything at all. Some were simply ordered to report to the nearest station, then bundled into unmarked cars and whisked away. Once inside City 40, they were forbidden from leaving or otherwise contacting the outside world for eight years. Unless, of course, they wanted to personally explain the mistake to Mr. Beria. As a result, the families of City 40's specialized workers spent the best part of a decade thinking they were dead. Unpleasant as things were for the experts, though, they had nothing on those doing the grunt work. The actual buildings were done by gulag prisoners who were treated exactly as well as you would imagine. While this probably sucked for all of them, it doubly sucked for those tasked with building the Mayak plant itself. Given Beria's primary concern was getting a bomb fast rather than safe, people were expected to handle radioactive material without any safety gear. Like, literally, they used their bare hands. It wouldn't be the last time the Mark facility gave someone a nasty dose of radiation poisoning. Yet life wasn't all relentless grimness in City 40. At a time when the USSR in general was a war-shattered, famine-plagued ruin, Beria ensured his prize workers got ample rations. When it came to build the housing, people were given their own spacious apartments miles above of the cramped communal conditions endured in most cities. The Nazis working slaves to death to build V2 rockets, this was not. Instead, think of it more as a trade-off. For those that did their job, Beria was willing to give them access to housing, healthcare, and education beyond their wildest dreams. For those who didn't, well, there were no shortages of places to dump a body out there in the Russian wilderness. By the fall of 1948, the first production reactor at Bark was at last online and ready. It was the start of a nuclear arms race that would nearly destroy the world. It was also the start of Russia's greatest environmental catastrophe.
Given that most of them had been forcibly relocated, if not outright kidnapped, you might expect the scientists at City 40 to have resented their situation. But that doesn't seem to have been the case. Most seem to have been proud to be working at Maya, calling themselves things like the Nuclear Shield and the Saviors of Humanity. And maybe it really did feel that way, like they were working to stop a power-hungry America from laying waste to the entire world. Ironically, the Saviors of Humanity were already contributing to some pretty huge humanitarian disasters. The Tekka is a minor river that flows past Mayak, passing through many isolated villages, where it's often the only major water source. Beginning in 1948, the Mayak facility began dumping its nuclear waste directly into it, leading to untold contamination. You could call this the first Karachay, the massive contamination of a body of water that locals relied upon. But in the race for the atomic bomb, what did a few poisoned villages really matter? That race, it finally ended on August 29, 1949. That day, an atomic device codenamed First Lightning, known as Joe One in the West, was detonated at the semi palatins test site in Kazakhstan. With a yield of around 20 kilotons, the bomb was easily equal to the USA's first efforts. It vaporized test structures the Soviets had built, casting a burning light high into the Kazakh sky. From that point on, the short era of US nuclear supremacy was over. The arms race was here. Meanwhile, the world of City 40 was starting to find its shape. As the realities of life in a closed city dawned, many were starting to find that it really wasn't so bad. Unlike the endless grey walls of concrete we might associate with Soviet cities, City 40 was designed to be beautiful, with plenty of open space and parks. There was also a culture of intellectual freedom brewing, one which must have been intoxicating to those used to Stalinism. With work as important as nuclear weapons, Beria had wisely relaxed the state's grip on information. The city's scientists could read books and debate ideas that were forbidden in Moscow. Go. Of course, there was still the omnipresent secret police, but so long as you were doing your work and not spying and not trying to let anyone know about the existence of Maya, you were generally left alone. It was a model that would soon become common across the USSR, the closed city that existed for pursuing secret projects. Pripyat, for example, which housed the workers at Chernobyl, would be managed in a similar way. And both cities would soon suffer the consequences. As the production of weapons-grade material increased, the disposal of waste at Mark became harder and harder. In 1951, it was finally decided that even the USSR couldn't get away with dumping so much poison into the Teha River, and plans were instead made for a system of reservoirs to act as medium-term storage facilities. While waiting for those pools to be dug, though, Mayak would begin dumping in a beautiful nearby lake. And we're not giving away any prizes for guessing the name of that lake. Starting that same year, Mayak began a process that would eventually see 200 million curies of radioactive waste spewed into Karachay, more than enough to either transform you into a superhero or, more likely, make you cough up blood and then die an agonizing death. And all the while, the bombs got bigger and bigger. By August 1953, the USSR had acquired and tested its first hydrogen bomb. Two years later, Moscow was detonating devices in the megaton range. Come 1961, the Soviets were able to detonate the Tsar bomber, a single device with ten times more explosive power than every single munition detonated in World War II combined. Yet even as the tests got bigger, the environment around the Mark facility only got more contaminated. Before the Tsar bomber had even been dreamed of, this would lead to what was then the worst nuclear disaster in history. Despite Lake Karachay being slowly filled with enough toxic waste to rival any river in Springfield, it wasn't the only storage place in the Mark complex. Liquid reactor waste was also being kept in giant underground tanks, tanks that weren't always kept in the best condition. By that, we mean it was totally possible for the cooling system in one of those tanks to malfunction and not be noticed for an entire year. And this was something of a massive problem because it turns out that keeping nuclear waste cool is pretty important. Over that year or so, the contents of the tank got hotter and hotter thanks to radioactive decay, eventually peaking at over 350 degrees Celsius. As it got hotter, the underground tank got more and more volatile, until one day, the inevitable happened. On the 29th of September 1957, the tank exploded with a force of 70 tons of TNT, enough to send its one meter thick concrete lid shooting into the air. Remember in 2000 when the US dropped a bomb on Afghan insurgents that was so big it was nicknamed the mother of all bombs? Well, the explosion in the Mayak tank that day was almost seven times as powerful. I'll also mention here that if you'd like to learn more about the mother of all bombs, I've got another channel called Mega Projects where we did an entire video about it. So 
please do check that out. I'll link to it below. As well as sending the tank's lid zooming off in the general direction of Pluto, the blast was enough to hurl a vast cloud of cesium-137 and strontium-90 high into the air. On the off chance you're not up on your radioactive isotopes, just know that this was very, very bad news. The deadly plume unleashed by the blast drifted northeast, eventually covering an area the size of Vermont. Sadly, despite City 40 being remote, the surrounding area was not uninhabited. Over 200 villages and small towns fell in the affected area, with as many as a quarter of a million people being exposed to this cloud of death. This being the Soviet Union, the authorities were all like, Evacu what? Running away to crybabies, here's a bot. Clean it up. While that's a joke, it's also close to the truth. Around the village of Kishtim, local authorities really did tell civilians to just clean this weird sludge off of their homes without any protective gear being needed. As for evacuation, only 10,000 people were ever moved out of the disaster zone. And even then, they were moved out late, and the authorities showed clear preference for ethnic Russians over any of the other groups. Within just a few weeks, area hospitals were filled with people suffering from radiation sickness. Today, it's still unknown exactly how many people died as a result of what's become known as the Kishtim disaster. You see, this was during the peak of Soviet secrecy. As Britannica's entry puts it, hundreds probably died, but we have no way of knowing for sure. What we do know, though, is the scale of the ecological disaster. Two-fifths of as much radioactivity as was later released at Chernobyl came spewing out of that tank, contaminating some 24,000 square kilometers of land. When the world finally found out about the accident, the International Atomic Energy Agency classified it as a level 6 event. The only other nuclear disasters to ever rank higher are Fukushima and Chernobyl. Many decades later, the authorities of Mark would say that this was the moment that made them see the light. The moment they decided to stop dumping waste into Lake Karache, fearing another accident. But as with so much under the Soviet system, this was just more misdirection. Even after contaminating an area bigger than the size of Wales, they kept right on dumping waste into Karache. In no time at all, this would lead to yet another lethal accident. By the time 1967 dawned, Lake Karachay had been receiving nuclear waste for almost 16 years. Other reservoirs had been created since dumping began, including one that would gain the nickname Plutonium Lake, but Karachay was still the oldest and the most contaminated. This was bad enough even during normal weather. The shore was so toxic that you could receive a fatal dose in the time it took to have a picnic. But at least everyone knew not to go chill out on Karachay's shores. They knew not to try sunbathing by the deadly water. In abnormal weather, such as the weather City 40 suffered in 1967, such knowledge was no help at all. It started that winter with an unusually dry start to the year. For the locals, this was presumably a case of great, less snow to soak my leaky communist boots. But then that dry winter was followed by a blazing hot summer. Everywhere, the ground turned to mud and cracked. Parched yellow grass withered into kindling. And lakes like Karaje dried out until there were entire sections without water. It was at this point that the problems began. All that toxic sludge dumped into Karache hadn't just vanished with the water, it had sunk down, contaminating the sediment on the lake bed to a depth of 3.5 meters. When that sediment was exposed during that brutal summer, it dried into very fine dust, a very fine dust that was whipped up by winds and sent scattering across the countryside. The irradiated particles formed clouds of death, clouds of radioactive material that flew over the forests, into City 40, out into the villages, and contaminated everything that it settled on. Before the rains returned, it's estimated some 63 villages were caught in the clouds' embrace, and a minimum of 41,000 people were affected. 41,000 people who breathed in that dust, who wiped it from their windows with bare hands, never even guessing that it could poison them and give them cancer. And just in case you were looking for extra proof that life is hugely unfair, some of those people were the survivors of the 1957 disaster. We've no proof that any of them subsequently decided to move to a lovely Ukrainian town called Chernobyl, but it would be entirely in keeping with these poor bastards' luck if they did. In the wake of the killer dust storm of 1967, it was decided that Lake Karache couldn't be allowed to remain as it was. There was just too much possibility that it could dry out again, too much chance it could unleash another radioactive dust storm. So in the aftermath of 1967, those in charge of Mark turned to conservation. By the mid-1980s, a new technology had been developed for rendering the lake safe. 
Hollow concrete blocks measuring one meter cubed would be placed on the lake bed, then filled with rocks and covered with soil to stop the contaminated sediment from escaping. Unfortunately, the technology was only perfected in time for everything to go to hell. First, in 1986, the world suffered its worst ever nuclear accident when Reactor 4 melted down at Chernobyl. Incidentally, it was because of this meltdown that we learned about the Kishtim disaster when the USSR submitted a report to the UN demonstrating it had previous nuclear cleanup experience. But it was the second event that would affect Lake Karachay the most. In the late 1980s, a wave of revolution began sweeping Eastern Europe. One by one, once invincible communist regimes tottered and fell with a resounding crash. Before long, this wave had reached the Soviet Union. By 1991, the entire nation was ready to dissolve. Sadly, post-Soviet Russia would be a little too busy with economic shocks and major instability to conduct nuclear cleanup operations. The result would be a late carriage that soon became even deadlier than ever. In 1991, a pair of reports into the state of the Mayak site produced some of the grimmest reading in science history. Not only was Mayak once one of the most contaminated places in the world, half of its dangerous material was contained in a single spot, Lake Karachay, a spot that was now drying out and in danger of triggering yet another disaster. And Karachay was just one of dozens of sites across the former USSR in need of immediate cleanup, from the anthrax-laden shores of Ural 7 to the big daddy of them all, Chernobyl. Yet even among this company, Karache stood out. As one US scientist who advised on the cleanup mused, If you went there for an afternoon picnic, you'd be dead. It's that radioactive. Karache would stay that way for the whole of the 90s. Although the plan to backfill the lake with concrete blocks was technically ongoing, the project was too starved of funds and too obscured by the chaos of post-Soviet Russia. All the way into 2004, there's evidence of continued dumping of nuclear waste around the site. Luckily, though, a place as dangerous as Karachay couldn't be ignored forever. In 2008, a new federal program was launched to clean up the world's deadliest lake. Part funded by the EU and the USA, it envisaged a massive operation to have the lake nearly entirely filled in by 2015. It was a complex operation, one involving dozens of trucks specially fitted with lead-lined cabins hauling those hollow concrete blocks up to the waters and tipping them in, an operation that ultimately cost $263 million. But it was also an operation that worked. In November 2015, an official ceremony was held to mark the final backfilling of the USSR's nuclear lake. A month later, Karachay was covered by rocks and dirt and it vanished from sight. Of course, the nuclear material is still there, buried far below, and while the former shores are way less dangerous now than they were, it still wouldn't be advisable to try sunbathing on them. Yet, the infilling of Lake Karachay isn't the end of the story. Not really. The residents of City 40 are still there, still living in their closed city, only now they're dealing with a huge increase in cancers and early deaths. In a grim twist of fate, they now have another hugely contaminated lake, one containing 120 million curies of radioactive material. Less than Karachay, sure, but still enough to cause serious health problems. But perhaps those who suffer the most are those living in the nearby villages. In 2009, Russian authorities finally recognized the victims of the 1957 leak and the deadly 1967 dust storm. One village that had suffered badly in both disasters, Masliumovo, was even compensated by the state. Each resident would receive either a new home or one million rubles. It sounded too good to be true, and it was. With painful openness, the corrupt authorities pocketed most of the cash. Those who'd chosen the payouts were given always nothing. Those who'd chosen the new home were moved to a brand new village two kilometers away, one that sat on land that was equally contaminated. That done, the old village was razed to the ground. Those in the new village subsequently received checks to compensate their loss and to help them buy medicine. The monthly payments amount to $15. Even in rural Russia, that's a laughable sum. Lake Karachay may be gone today, but its toxic legacy still remains. It's a legacy of secrecy, of cover-up, of dangerous mistakes made at the dawn of the nuclear age. But it's also something personal, something tens of thousands of Russian villagers have to live with each and every day, a physical legacy hanging over their lives like a toxic cloud. Lake Karachay may soon fade into memory, but for its victims and the victims of all the other accidents at the Mayak site, its after-effects will last a lifetime. So I'm not going to ask whether you enjoyed that video, but I do hope you found it interesting. If you did, please do give us a thumbs up below. Don't forget to subscribe if you're not already. Thank you for watching.